Good evening. Hope you can see me. Hope we're okay. We're going to talk tonight about the Chomar Chava. We talk about the broad wall, the Chomar Chava, and the importance of the broad wall from the first 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 temple period in the Jewish quarter after the Six Day War, and the drama of the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem 2,700 years ago. We're going to try and connect it as well to the Six Day War, and also talk about, in some sense, connect it also to the to Jerusalem Day. 53 years ago when Jerusalem was reunited, the city of Jerusalem was reunited. This is what the broad wall looks like. And it's uh, it's right off of the cardo. It's right in the middle of the Jewish quarter. If you don't notice it, it's right off the cardo, right next to the, the public toilets or the Hurva, uh, Hurva Square. It's right behind it. But if you don't notice it, you really won't know its, its story. The broad wall was found by Professor Nachman Avigad in, uh, in a large dig, which took about 10 years from 1970 to 1980. The wall that, that we see here is about 40 meters long, made of large stones, seven meters wide, seven meters wide, it's over 20 feet wide. Estimated, it was estimated to be at approximately eight meters high. The view we're looking towards is to the northeast. In other words, we're looking, is to the northeast. In other words, we're looking towards the Arab court in that direction with Mount Zion being on our backs. The left side would be outside the city, and the right side would be the inside of the city. Nachman Avigad identified as from 2700 years ago from the time of Hezekiah. Now, I have to give a little background to the find because the find was really ex exceptional. That we talk about a little bit about the archaeology of Jerusalem. There were, no there were no extensive digs done before 1967 inside the old city wall. Inside the old city wall during the Jordanian period, uh, an English archaeologist called Catherine Kenyon had dug next to the uh, next to the the uh, the churches, the double churches, the uh, double, the uh, the churches, and she said she found nothing there from the first temple period, and she she believed that everything Jerusalem, the old the upper city, in other words, the Jewish quarter area, the upper the upper city of Jerusalem was not occupied until to the time of the Hashmonim, 2,200 years ago, that there was no one living there before, before that. I have to give a little background as well. The 1947, November 27, November 1947, the Jewish quarter was under siege, and two weeks after the Declaration of Independence, the Jewish quarter fell, and all the residents were expelled. Synagogues in the old city were destroyed. During the Six-Day War, this Jewish quarter was recaptured. Now, I, I, could you imagine, for 19 years, there was no one living in the Jewish quarter, the people that had been living there for families that have been living there for hundreds of years, all of a sudden they come back to the Jewish quarter. And I would imagine there'd be an enormous pressure to rebuild the Jewish quarter right away. This is a story told about one of the Jewish, one of the leaders, one of the officers, a man called Eli Kedar, who during the war, he was in the Jerusalem Brigade and he, had, he, came, in from, he came in from the Dungate and he went down to the Western Wall. And then he went back to conquered, reconquered the, uh, the Jewish quarter. And then right away what he did was he went and brought his father to bring him to show them where his house had once been. In other words, there was a, a longing to return to the Jewish quarter for 19 years. You would, you would imagine, I would imagine, most people would, would believe that what they would have done is, what Israel would have done is they would right away have rebuilt the Jewish quarter. But Israel, I believe this is really interesting because when you think about it, if you go to Megiddo, you'll see 27 layers of history, 12 or 20 layers of history. But Israel honors the past, honors the past. And before rebuilding, there was a decision to reveal the story of the area. So due to the enormous, it was a 10 year dig. And during this, this enormous dig, which lasted more than a decade, many finds were made, including the Cardo from about 1500 years ago, the eroding quarter, which is 2000 years ago, the burnt house 2000 years ago, the Israeli Israelite tower, 2,600 years ago, the Nia Church, 1,400 years ago, the German Hospice, the Crusader period, and the Rambam Synagogue. In other words, they found finds not only with a Jewish background, but giving the story of Jerusalem. The reason why there was, a find, there was an opportunity to find these treasures was because the Israeli government decided to, to delay the rebuilding of the, the Jewish quarter in order to uncover, to attempt to uncover the proof of Israel's past. The accepted belief, as I said before, is that there was no settlement in the upper city before the Hellenistic period. There was an argument going on among the, among the archaeologists. What was the situation of the size? What was the size of Jerusalem during the first temple period? There was a prevailing theory was the minimizing theory 
it said that the Jerusalem was during the first temple period was only the city of David, 40 to 60 dunam, and, and even if you include the Temple Mount, which is the area would be bordered by the Kidron Valley, the Tepropian Valley in the west, the city seems too small to accommodate the palaces in the temple described in the Bible. The city is too small, that's what they felt, to fit the Bible te description. In other words, the Bible is not a historical, uh, historical document, and they were, hasn't been solved yet. There is reference in the Bible, a uh, maximizing theory said, well, no, wait a second, maybe what was found, we can still say that, we can still say that the Bible it agrees to the Bible. In the Bible, it talks about two neighbors that exist in the upper city, the Mishnah and the Maftesh. There was a uh, Hulda, the prophet who came from one of those. And even if we accept that the, the area, walled area was only the city of David and the Temple Mount, the entire city could have been larger than the area within, within the walls. The city of David uh, within the walls, which only included the city of David and the Temple Mount. People could have lived outside the walls and moved inside and the walls would be there for time of danger. The size of the city that has been found before 1960 cannot be used as proof that the city described in the Bible is not accurate. Nachman Avigad, when he found it, finding the wall he came to, he writes, this is coming from his book, The Upper City of Jerusalem, Yirel Yonashi Yerushalayim. He writes, to find, you have to understand that he was a major archaeologist from Hebrew University and he was one of the people who was in the minimalist theory, using the minimalist theory, and he writes like this, the finding of the Israeli wall, Israelite wall, the broad wall, came to us as such a surprise because who would expect to find a wall in this location? The un unexpected locations gave us headaches on the question of its route. But with that, from the perspective, this is one of the most important finds ever made in Jerusalem. I had that the feeling that with the discovery of the Israeli wall, we made history. My colleagues, the expert searchers of Jerusalem, added to this feeling in their statements about the wall that this is the most important archaeological find of the century in Jerusalem. Imagine we're talking about a wall from 2,600 years ago, but not only 2,700 years ago, but not only that, he's changing the theory that existed. In other words, this, this, this wall ties back to the history of Jerusalem, ties back to the Bible, tells the story of Hezekiah. Okay, this is a map of the city. The map includes altitudes. And right around here, this is, this is what we're talking about. That's the broad wall. We're talking about this would be the black line signifies the old city walls, the old city walls which were built in the 16th century by Suleiman the Magnificent, okay? And this is the Temple Mount, and that's the city of David. So the minimalists said that that was the only city that existed during the first temple period, going back to King David, going back to Solomon, first temple period. Nachman Avigad, in finding this, the theory changed, and they include all of the area included in this dotted line, so that Mount Zion, which is right over here, Har Zion, which is right over here, was included, even though it's not included in the old city walls, Colonel city walls, and the city of Jerusalem became a large metropolis. Now the question is, the question is, it doesn't answer the question of what happened at the King David's period, and there's still an argument going on in that, saying that there, we haven't had archaeological proof, they haven't, even though in the city of David, Eilat Bazar found what she believes to be the palace, what we believe to be the palace of King David. She hasn't found anything saying that King David lived here. Hezekiah, the broad wall, we have a different story because we have proof talking about things that were found outside in Nineveh, in the capital of Assyria, where, where they talk about what was here. Okay. Now, this is another picture. So this is just to give the same feeling. Mount Moriah being the Temple Mount, that's the city of David. This is Mount Zion. And this is even the up, this is approximately where the Jaffa Gate would be. So the wall would go like this. And this is approximately the spot of the broad wall. Okay. And it's standing right above Nachal Tzolev, the transfer valley. Now, you can't see that valley anymore because it's been filled in over time, but it exists. You know, which is just showing this, this picture. Okay. This is the broad wall again, showing the same picture. Okay. And this is a, is a, as if you come there, you'll actually see that there's a, something going way up, saying that the height of the broad wall would have been eight meters high. Eight meters high, you're talking about, if you take uh, three meters, you're talking about the size of a six-story building, approximately six-story building. The street level in those days was lower than it is now, so maybe it's around this high, so it's only about six meters, six or seven meters above the street level, but an enormous wall. Now, it was built on base rock. Right over here, if you're looking to the right, you'll see over here, this is base rock. That's the view outside of 
Hezekiah, outside of Jews in Hezekiah's period. We're going to talk about the, the drama referred to in the Bible, where the leaders of the Assyrian army, after they had conquered Lachish, the second largest city in Jerusalem, in, in Judah, they were screaming propaganda in Jeru to the trapped people of Jerusalem. In other words, they were standing on this side of the city. They were standing on, on that side, and they're screaming at the people in Jerusalem in they're screaming in Hebrew. And Hezekiah requests, and the, Israeli, and the Jewish army says, please don't speak in Hebrew, you're ruining the morale of the people. Now, this is a view of the north towards Mount Zion with the remains of a wall, of a building below the wall, right over here. In other words, you're looking in this direction. But this is a close, you can see the building, and there's a building here, and you can see remains of walls from rooms. It's clear that the building, the wall, was built later above the home above the home can we um, can we just assume in other words this is the same picture can we assume when they built the wall they were in a rush in other words the assyrian army was coming to jerusalem they had conquered lachish they had conquered ashkelon and they were away to jerusalem and what they did was they, they did an enormous building project to build the, board, the the wall to be able to protect the jews the jews staying inside the city in the bible in isaiah went Isaiah 22, there's a direct reference. It appears, we can't tell for certain, but there seems to be a direct reference to this building, to the buildings, because he writes there that the people, that they broke houses to build the walls. In other words, they must have confiscated areas and they built above the houses. And when you come there, you can actually see the remains of a building sitting outside the wall, below the wall seems to tie exactly into the Bible. We're going to continue. We'll talk about that in a little while. At the tourists at the sign, there's a, actually a quote. The quote goes, this is the built wall. It was built over 2,700 years. It was part of the, of the wall surrounding Jerusalem, Western Hill, end of the 8th century. It went for a length of 65 meters. We only see 40 meters outside. And the name of the broad wall appears in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Now, if you're standing at the wall, you can actually see they put these uh, marble to signify the continuation of the broad wall, and it's going towards the cardo. In other words, the cardo is in that direction. And if you stand inside the cardo, in the, the northern part of the cardo, in other words, the cover over where the stores are, you'll see on the floor, you'll see a continuation of the broad wall, the way its path following these stones. Okay. In Nehemiah, it refers to the broad wall, and it talks about, in Nehemiah, we're talking about 2,400 years ago, after the beginning of the Second Temple period. The Jews came back to Jerusalem from Babylon, and uh, they started building. They were re rebuilding the wall. We won't go into the, the story of Nehemiah Wall, which is a fascinating story in, in and of itself. But it, there's a, a verse there, the, one of the verses in uh, ch chapter 3, verse 8. It says, they built up to, they filled Jerusalem until the Homar or Chava, until the broad wall. That's where the, we believe that's what we were referring to, and that's the name that they gave to the broad wall. Now, Sancheret, we have evidence of the story. When we look into uh, Indian Ve, they found a the Lachish plaque, which talks about, which tells the story of the capture of Lachish. If you go down to Lachish, Lachish was the second, second largest, second most important city in Judah in those days. It was on the crossroads going down to Egypt. And, and to the coast. In other words, that was a very important city. And uh, the Assyrians came and put a siege on the city. And if you go to the Israel Museum, you can see a copy. If you go to the British Museum, the original, and it shows the pic right in the picture we're looking at right now, we can actually see the people being taken out into, you can see the people taking to the diaspora, taking to Galut, stories that they captured. They put a siege on Lachish, put a siege on the siege. They captured the Assyrians, captured Lachish, and they took the people away. And they disturbed, they distributed all the land that had been in, in the area, and they gave it to the enemies of Judah. Okay, now there's a prism. There's a uh, prism which tells the story. This is the Taylor prism, and it proclaims that 46 walled cities in Judah and, and other settlements were conquered by the Assyrians. And that 200,000 people and livestock were deported. I want you to understand the situation. We're talking about 20 years after the 10 tribes were deported. And now the Assyrians came back 
and they conquered Lachish, and they came to put a siege on Jerusalem. 200,000 people. We haven't found the 10 tribes. We're talking about 200,000 people in livestock were deported. We don't know whether it's 200,000 people and livestock, whether that means that 200,000 people or that includes the livestock. So in any event, let's say it's only 50,000 people, 150,000 livestock. That's not what the important thing, the important concept is that they were deported and the conquered territory was divided among the three kings of Philistine. And right here, this is what the translation, as for his, this is the translation of the prism. I besieged, took these cities, 200,000 cities, himself, and then he talks about Hezekiah. As for Hezekiah, who didn't submit to my, woke, my yoke, 46 of his strong wall cities, the stall cities, and leveled them with battering rams, bringing up siege engines, that shows up in the picture and the, the plaque we have. If you go to Lachish, you can also, there's archeological uh, proof exactly it. You walk up on the storming <clears throat> where the battering rams were. And Hezekiah, like a cage bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. I threw up against him earthworks, turned them back. Now, when they read this, it's interesting to note, he's bragging, Sancherev is bragging. He's bragging that he conquered all of Judah. He comes to Jerusalem. It doesn't say he conquered Jerusalem. It says he himself, like a cage bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. In other words, they put a siege on Jerusalem. They did not conquer Jerusalem. This agrees to the story that shows up in the Bible. And here we go. The Bible story just in, shows up in three places. It shows up in Kings 2, Chronicles, and Isaiah. Hezekiah begins, and I'm just going to summation, do a quick summation. Hezekiah begins, begins his kingdom before the Assyrians conquer the kingdom of Israel. Assyrians conquer Israel and deport all of its people to the diaspora. Hezekiah pays, pays them off. The golden temple doors of Jerusalem, Jerusalem was saved. Years pass, and he makes, Hezekiah makes a treaty with Egypt and Ashkelon. He makes a treaty with the south, with the people in the south, hoping they will help him against Assyria. Syria conquers Ashkelon and then puts a siege on Lachish, the second city of Judah. Lachish is conquered. Syria sends its army from Lachish to Jerusalem, puts a siege on the city. Hezekiah prepares the city to withstand the siege. He builds a wall around the city, digs a tunnel to bring the Gihon spring within the city wall. He prepares the city to be able to overcome the siege. The Assyrians surround the city and scream to the people of Jerusalem to surrender. They spoke in Hebrew to ruin the morale of the people. Hezekiah tells his officers to request they speak in Arabic so the people will not understand. The situation is bad. The nation prays to God. Hezekiah requests the prophet Isaiah's help. Isaiah reports that nothing will happen and Syria will return the way it came. The army disap either disappears or 185 soldiers miraculously, miraculously die. Sancherov dies. Divrei Yamir goes like this. They called out in a loud voice in Judean, in Hebrew, to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten them and terrify them. And then it says, it says in Kings they, that he sent out, that Hezekiah sent out his people and told them, don't speak in Hebrew, you're ruining the morale. Every time I come to the, to the wall, every time I come to the wall, I usually stand there and I, and I try and relive the constant, relive the story. I'm standing right by on the Jerusalem, the city city, size and I can just imagine I scream to the people for surrender surrender imagining the uh, army of Assyria screaming at the Jews who are held inside or sieged inside the city imagine what their morale was like all the 46 all the city all the cities have been overrun the only thing that's left is Jerusalem only thing that's left is Jerusalem They've, they know that the Chish, the second most important city is gone the people have been deported the ten tribes are gone. Jerusalem is filled with refugees. We believe that Jerusalem was filled with refugees who had come from the ten tribes. So can you imagine them telling, you know what happened when the Assyrians conquered Israel? They sent everybody out. They deported. We haven't heard from them yet. We haven't gotten any letters. They're refugees. Hezekiah and his prophet, he, he says, he cries out to heaven. He says, please help us. And it came tonight that and uh, Hezekiah and Isaiah comes and says, don't worry, nothing will happen. By the way, he comes, he shall return in the city. He will not enter the city. That shows in, in Malachim, in Kings. And it came to pass in the night, depends who you're reading. 
if you read in Kings 2, it says, It came to pass on the night that an angel of the Lord went out and slew 185,000 in the camp of Syria, and they rose in the morning, and behold, they were all dead corpse. corpse. On the other side, it says, Saved Hezekiah, and they, the next morning they were all gone. Some people say that it was just a, a plague, maybe a corona that came and attacked them. And Sanchrev left and went away. In, in the Talmud, it talks about Hezekiah, and he says that he did three things. He performed six actions. Three things they praise him, and three things they don't praise him. One of the three things they don't praise him, he sealed the waters of the upper Gihon Spring, diverting its waters into the city by mm -hmm. the town, and they didn't honor or thank him. <clears throat> they asked, why did they, this discussion about it? They said, why didn't they thank him? Why, did, why wasn't he honored? He was trying to save the city. They say he should have had belief in God. He shouldn't have made a treaty, perhaps. He shouldn't have made a treaty with Egypt. He shouldn't have made a treaty with Ashkelon. He should have had belief in God and understood that the army won't help. What will help is only God's help. There's a, another discussion. It tells us that Hezekiah could have been the Messiah if he had sung praise to God after Sancherib and the Assyrians abandoned the siege of Jerusalem. He could have been the Messiah. There was an opportunity for redemption that was thwarted. Thwarted, I heard a, a, lecture, a lecture by, uh, by Rav Sharkey, and he talked about, he was talking about the, the, the importance of saying Hallel saying Hallel on the night of uh, Israel Independence Day. And he, quoted, he went to the story of Hezekiah and he was talking about Hezekiah, that Hezekiah did not, say, did not sing praise to God. And he had three answers of why. He had three answers why he didn't say, sing praise to God. One of them was he, 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 perhaps he was feeling sorry that there were so many people that were killed. Many answers are given. <clears throat> Hezekiah perhaps, Hezekiah felt that a, a full song of thanksgiving would be inappropriate because the miracle had not benefited the entire Jewish people, but only a single pride. I heard Professor Gabi Barkay talk about it, and he said to me, he said to the, the class I was in, he said, you know, can you imagine, can you imagine the 10 tribes of God, the Jewish people are at the verge. If they are conquered, this is the last hope for the Jewish people. 10 tribes are gone, Lachish is gone, Hezekiah, is saved, a miracle happens. But not like the Jewish people where we say on Haggadah, on Pesach night, we read the Hallel because we're supposed to feel like it happened to us. Hezekiah didn't sing praise at that moment. Perhaps he sang praise in some sense. Perhaps he said, but he didn't have a full heart. Perhaps not. Kavi Barker, you said, perhaps the reason why you're not, you think about it, here's a king. His kingdom is gone. All that is left is Jerusalem. Maybe that's why he didn't see him praise. Think about it. All of Judah was conquered. 46 towns destroyed. Thousands set away. Achish conquered. Only Jerusalem remained. Only Jerusalem remained of his kingdom. Other people would say perhaps it was from honor. He, he, had, he felt whatever. Okay. I want to go back to the beginning and, and, and compare, go back to the concept here. We're talking about Hezekiah is the broad wall. The broad wall is found only because of the Six-Day War. And I want to compare for just a moment the Six-Day War and Hezekiah's War 2,700 years ago. 1948, the Six-Day War in 1967. Three years after the end of World War II and the Holocaust, Jerusalem became a state, fought against all the countries surrounding it. 6,000 soldiers died. 1% of the population, there were only 600,000 Jews in Israel at that time. It was before the great influx of uh, people. In the 1956 war, Israel captured the Sinai Peninsula, was forced out by Russia, US, US and Russia. After the 56 war, an agreement was made to place a UN peace, peace force in the Sinai, demilitarized. In May 1967, Egypt requested the UN to leave the Sinai, then immediately rearm the Sinai. Egypt closed the seas, leading to Eilat, the, the uh, Tehran Straits. It was demonstrations, daily demonstrations in Cairo, which promised this to destroy Israel, to push Israel into the sea. Egypt, Syria, and Jordan joined forces for three weeks. Israel begged the world, begged the world, the UN, the US, Russia, to stand by their commitment that was made in 1950, 1956, to stand by the commitment. Public parks were prepared to become vast cemeteries. I always think back, and I was in high school in those days, in 1967, I was a senior in high school, at ages me, I imagine. But I remember seeing the, I remember seeing the, the, the demonstrations which were on New York television, 
and of pushing Israel into the sea. And myself and my, my cousin, we went to school in, in lower Manhattan, myself, my cousin, Mike. We, every day we cut classes. We were, we were seniors, we could do what we wanted. We cut classes and we went to the Isaiah wall next to the UN and said prayers, hopefully, to hope that the UN, some solution would come. After three weeks of no help in sight, no one was gonna help. Israel did a preemptive strike, which essentially destroyed Egypt's air force and the war began. 1967, the Jewish state was on the brink, was on the brink. Hezekiah's war, 2,700 years ago, the kingdom of Jerusalem was defeated and they were dispersed. Kingdom of Judah was all that is left of the, of the 12 tribes. 20 years passed and he made a treaty with Egypt, Ashkelon, signed a treaty. The Assyrian is led by King Sarah of attack. Ashkelon is captured and destroyed. Israel, Judah, Jerusalem is alone. Sounds like the 67 war. The second city of the kingdom, Lachish is seized, and in it, and it and all the kingdom of Judah is captured. The people are sent away as evidenced by the Lachish clans. All that is left of the Jewish kingdom and the people is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is under siege and the city is surrounded. If it falls, will the fate of Judah be the same as the 10 tribes? If it falls, would we be here today? Would the Jewish people have survived or would we have just been deported? Israel is, isn't destroyed. Hezekiah is in a cage and the Bible describes the saving of Jerusalem. Bible saving. It is fascinating when you think about it that the broad wall tells us we can connect to the Bible. Going back to the picture we saw before of the wall underneath, this wall underneath, standing underneath. You stand there, you look down, and then you read Isaiah 22. And they broke the houses to build the wall. You're standing there, you're looking down, you see, you can see what Isaiah wrote. Isaiah wrote. The Bible, it connects exactly to the Bible, exactly to the Bible. Hezekiah, the broad wall connects back. When I think about this, we did that already. I always like to, every, every tour that I lead, I usually connect back to the Tehillim, 122nd Psalm, the third verse. It goes like this. Yushalayim Abni Jerusalem was built up like a city which is connected together. Connection for the commentators. There are a whole bunch of commentators give a whole bunch of answers. One connection is, it's either the connection is between the city on earth and the heavens above, or between the lower city, the city of David, and the upper city, perhaps referring to the new Pilgrim, newly discovered Pilgrim Road in the city of David, which goes back to the Second Temple period. Or Jerusalem connects all people together to think about it. Jerusalem connects all three religions. Millions of people relate to Jerusalem as the holy city. Jerusalem, hopefully, should also connect the people together. After the Six-Day War in 67, which saved the state of Israel, it was stated, the verse revealed, if you look in, in books written in 1967, 68, they all, they all relate to this. Jerusalem is a city connected together. They tore down the wall that separated the new city from the old city, and they said this was the verse. But perhaps I have another idea, and I think that, especially you're standing at the broad wall, it refers to a feeling one can get in Jerusalem. We can, in some sense, connect to the past. Being in Jerusalem enables us to connect our present to Jerusalem, to its, to our past. Perhaps the best example of connecting to the present with the past is at the broad wall. It was found 50 years ago, 53 years ago, 50 years ago after the Six Day War. And when you're standing there, you see that house that's built below the wall. Remember Isaiah 22. We can remember the biblical story of the war against the Assyrians 2,700 years ago. We can, pair, we can compare the miracle described, which saved the people then, with the miraculous happenings in 1967 which saved the Jewish state. That's it. I'm going to try and see if I can actually see. Uh, last time I didn't succeed in seeing chats, so if anybody has any chat comments, I don't know how I can see it. But I'm basically finished. Any questions, you can ask the put. I don't know how I'm going to find them. How do I get the questions? Do we have questions or anything? Let me get this in the largest. Howie raised a hand. Yes, Howie. Can, I, can we undo the, uh, the, the mute? Unmute. I can't unmute it. Someone has to unmute it. How do I get to see the chats? I am bad at this. I apologize. 
and we can do this, we can do this like this. Okay, we're in the chat. Be wrong, share a little bit of do, 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 questions and answers. Okay, questions. No other questions. Howie, write your question down if you'd like, and they'll be able to see it. Okay. Anybody else? We had 35 people here. That's okay. No question. I apologize. Okay, Tzachi, you're still there? Are there recordings? There will be a recording. Hopefully, there'll be a recording, and it'll be on YouTube, and you'll be able to find it at Reshit. And Reshit, there'll be uh, another lecture on Tuesday. Next week, there are going to be another, still uh, three more lectures in the series. And uh, that's about it. Okay. It's been my pleasure. Any other questions? You write it on the answer live. There will be. There will be. There will be. Okay. Done. Okay. Answer. Okay. Been my pleasure. Thank you so much. And wait, wait a second. Let me tell Saki. Okay. Oh. Hey, wait. When did the list Lachish conquest take place? It was the Lachish conquest took place about right before right before they came to Jerusalem. We're talking 700, about 700 BC. We're talking about that. We're going back 2,700 years ago. Any other questions? One second more. How do you get that? Chat. Okay. When is your next tour, Andy? I don't know yet. Thanks for the lecture. Thanks for the fascinating lecture. Especially enjoyed your story about cutting classes. That was my, uh, I have to add one more thing. Uh, one last thing. My cousin says that the reason why the two of us were able to do Aliyah was because going, standing at that Isaiah wall in 1967 really lit our desire to come to Israel. Okay, 701. Okay, pleasure. Bye-bye.